right. <laughs> Habib Deep. All right. Good afternoon. Uh, Alan, welcome. Anybody else coming down the hall, Alan? Uh, as they say, après moi le déluge. So as long as, yeah. All right, uh, let's start off with a uh, situation in Ukraine. Um, the humani our humanitarian partners and ourselves are deeply concerned about the plight of civilians following the intensification of hostilities in the eastern Donbas region, and then the Kherson Khersonska, Kharkivska, and Dnipropetrovska oblasts, excuse me. In Luhansk oblast, heavy fighting and airstrikes have reportedly impacted residential areas in both government and non-government controlled areas, particularly between per, uh, Pervomaisk and Zolote. Critical water, electricity and gas infrastructure and health facilities have been destroyed, leaving civilians without access to life-sustaining services and supplies. Um, from... Uh, from Siverdonetsk, uh, we have received reports of residential areas and education facilities being impacted by uh, the fighting. In Donetsk, we have received disturbing reports of civilians being killed in areas experiencing increasing hostilities, including people who have previously fled from the besieged areas of Mariupol. Access challenges have prevented the UN from ver verifying these reports. We continue to call on all parties to the conflict to enable the safe delivery of assistance and facilitate the safe passage of civilians evacuating areas where hostilities are increasing in line with discussions held by the Under Secretary General uh, Martin Griffiths during his visits to Moscow and Kiev. The High Commissioner for Human Rights has recorded 4,335 civilian casualties across Ukraine since 24th of February, including at least 1,842 people have been killed. The actual civilian death toll is expected to be much higher. As these figures do not include people killed in areas experiencing intense and sustained hostilities, between the 24th of April and the 7th, excuse me, between the 24th of March and the 7th of April, we and our partners have more than doubled the reported humanitarian, the reported numbers of people reached with humanitarian supplies and protection services from 890,000 to 2.1 million people. This includes 2 million people reached with food assistance, more than 956,000 people who've received health care support. The UN is also gradually returning to the capital, to Kiev, starting with the presence of some senior officials. We'll provide more details once security conditions uh, permit it. Um, excuse me, uh, two seconds. Uh, back here, you will see that the Security Council is uh, wrapping up a meeting on Ukraine, and particularly on the impact of women and girls. The executive director of UN Women, Sima Bahus, said she just returned from Moldova, where she said the consequences of the senseless war in Ukraine were stark. Moldova has opened its borders and homes, hosting an estimated 95,000 Ukrainians. Ms. Bahus noted that this war has starkly illustrated gender-based differences, pointing to how women and women are largely absent from any current negotiating efforts. Women's involvement is both right and an opportunity for better outcomes, she stressed. Also speaking today was UNICEF's Emergency Program Director, Manuel Fontaine, and he'll be joining us in the briefing room shortly. The Special Envoy for Yemen, Hans Grunberg, arrived today in Sanaa. He's looking forward to engaging with Ansar Allah leadership on implementing and strengthening the truce and discussing the way forward. And I can tell you that the Secretary General is following with deep concern the escalating violence in the occupied Palestinian territory and Israel. He is appalled by the increasingly high number of casualties, including women and children. He reiterates that children must never be the target of violence or put in harm's way. The Israeli Defense Forces must exercise maximum restraint, and the use of lethal force only is a last resort when it is strictly unavoidable in order to protect life. We will continue to work with all sides to de-escalate uh, the situation. 
Quick update from Myanmar, where the UN team there remains alarmed by the deteriorating humanitarian situation, with civilians continuing to suffer amid continued fighting, particularly uh, in the country's southeast and northwest. Across Myanmar, more than 900,000 men, women, and children are displaced, including more than 560,000 people who remain uprooted due to the conflict since the military takeover in February last year. Uh, the UN Refugee Agency estimates that 35,700 people from Myanmar have crossed the neighboring countries. The 2022 Humanitarian Response Plan seeks to reach six, a record 6.2 million people and requires $826 million. To date, it is only 4% funded. Uh, we urge the donors to give generously in solidarity with the people of Myanmar, supporting them to live in safety, dignity, and particularly hard-won development gains while there's still a window to do so. Aid organizations, together with local partners, continue providing assistance to displaced people in host communities wherever they can amid serious access challenges. Unconditional, predictable, and sustained humanitarian access is paramount to help as many vulnerable people as possible, especially in conflict areas. The humanitarian community in Myanmar continues to urge all parties to respect international humanitarian law, to protect civilians, and ensure that people in need have access to humanitarian assistance. We are concerned by the reports of escalating casualties from landmines and other explosives, as well as forced recruitment. And from the Democratic Republic of the Congo, a couple of updates for you. First, from uh, the Ruchuru area, where we can report that while the situation remains volatile following clashes between the Congolese Army and the M23 uh, armed group, we, along with our humanitarian partners, are distributing aid to displaced people. Close to 54,000 civilians have been displaced because of these clashes. Over the weekend, WFP started distributing high-energy biscuits to some 6,500 people. The agency has also pre-positioned 30 tons of food for distribution. UNHCR, for its part, also distributed shelter and non-food items to some 2,500 people. And WHO donated a first batch of medicines and other medical equipment to local authorities to treat at least 1,000 civilians. Turning to the neighboring province of Ituri, where in recent months, We've reported an increase in violent attacks on civilians, including on displacement sites. Our humanitarian colleagues tell us that at least 20 civilians died this morning following an armed attack in Mangusu, which is located in Urumu territory. Humanitarians tell us that in the past week, at least 40 civilians have died in a spate of attacks. People have been forced to flee their homes, and our colleagues at Ocha say the humanitarian organizations in the area have had to suspend operations temporarily temporarily quick update from bolivia um where the un team led by a resident coordinator susana sotoli continues to work with the government and other partners to support the national covid 19 response including in the country's vaccination plan over 8 million covid 19 vaccines arrived in bolivia through covax alone and on socioeconomic front, we have also boosted safety protocols and provided food supplies, allowing over 50,000 children and adolescents to return to school while supporting the training of more than 4,000 teachers on biosafety measures. We also continue to support the most vulnerable people while working with national authorities on programs to recover better together from COVID-19. We've also boosted the livelihoods of families and households in more than 300 indigenous communities and more than 600 self-employed uh, women. Um, tomorrow, programming, you know, tomorrow at 11.30, the Deputy Secretary General, Mina Mohammed will be here to brief you on the launch of the 2022 Financing for Sustainable Development Report entitled Bridging the Finance, uh, Bri excuse me, Bridging the Finance Divide. Um, ending up with some good news on the, uh, on the budget. Um, we are now at 84, and a little challenging ge geography quiz for you today. The full payment comes from a member state that has a sovereign parliamentary democracy and that has two co-princes as the head of state. One of them is the Bishop of Urgell. That country is? Mario, if you were paying attention, you'd know what that country is. It's Andorra. That'll teach you not to play. Edie. 
And we thank our friends in Andorra La Vieja. Um, a couple of, a couple of questions um, on follow-ups. First, um, I didn't. I don't think I heard you say anything about Martin Griffiths. Where is he? Um, what's he up to? in terms of the Secretary General's mission uh, trying to get a ceasefire in Ukraine. And then I have two other follow-ups. Uh, he is continuing his uh, travels. Uh, I think he'll be heading to Turkey uh, soon, but he's continuing to travel around the region. And there's um, apparently um, Hans Grunberg is in the sauna today. I mentioned that. Yes. Yeah. Um, is there a readout of um, no, what I mean, he's, he, he, he's, he's continuing his talks. He'll be there through Wednesday. Oh. Yeah. So yeah, will, can, will we get some kind of a readout at uh, the end, hopefully? From your mouth to my ears to the ears of people who can actually deliver the readouts to us, but I believe we will. And a, a, another follow-up, uh, Pakistan has a new prime minister. Um, does the Secretary General have any comment on this change in leadership? Sure. The, the Secretary General continues to closely follow developments in Pakistan, including the election of Shabazz Sharif as the country's new prime minister uh, earlier today. The Secretary General underlines the utmost importance of respecting democratic processes and institutions and resolving differences in accordance with the Constitution of Pakistan. Pam. Steph. Um, first is procure, uh, uh, two questions. One is procurement. Have you received about a month ago the Ukrainian mission sent a letter um, calling for the uh, UN Secretariat not to procure goods from Russia? And then there was a more recent letter. Did you Sure. We did receive uh, earlier in March a petition by the uh, letter by the permanent mission of, U of Ukraine. Uh, to us to, quote, immediately suspend all non-essential procurement cooperation of the UN with the Russian Federation. We responded to the permanent mission of Ukraine a few days later that the procuring of goods and services and works by uh, the UN, by the Secretariat, is in accordance with the mandate given to us by the General Assembly and in, uh, in, perform in conformance with the financial regulations of the uh, UN, which requires such procurement actions to be done on the basis of best value for money, fairness, integrity, and transparency, and effective international competition. All right. Since then, they have said uh, that was an unsatisfactory answer. Is there any consideration of the issues of war, uh, the war in Ukraine, in terms of procurement? Well, I mean, we're, we're following. There is a central procurement which we must do. Uh, I mean, it's no secret that uh, you know, a lot of our uh, aviation uh, procurement for peacekeeping and just logistics uh, comes from the Russian Federation with also uh, quite a bit from, uh, from Ukraine. The rules are set by the General Assembly and we follow those, those rules. So our position is set uh, by the, the by the rules, the financial rules that we have to, um, uh, that we are, that we follow. And I did slog through the the procurement manual today. Does that preclude, just to be clear, does that preclude any political decisions in terms of? I mean, of I, I think it's pretty clear. Uh, the rules say procurement actions are done on the basis of best value for money, fairness, integrity, and transparency, and effective international competition. And then the second question is just on uh, the Ukraine ambassador just said 120,000 children have been taken out by Russia out of Ukraine, uh, assumed to be for adoption. Um, I know we're going to hear from UNICEF, but is the UN tracking any of this? Thanks. Well, I mean, as you said, you will hear from UNICEF, which would be in the, in the poll position on anything to do with children. Philippe. Thank you, Stéphane. On uh, Moura, anything new? Uh, did you be able to, to go to, to Moura in the, in, the, in the city? And also, 
when do you expect the report of the in investigation report and when do you plan to present it to the Security Council? Uh, on, um, on Moura, no, uh, nothing more to, I have not gotten any updates from our colleagues in Mali. Uh, those, are, if I'm not mistaken, the peacekeeping mission in Mali is supposed to report quarterly on human rights uh, investigation. So I think they will follow that calendar. If there's anything in between, I will let you know. Alan. Sorry, thank you so much, Stefan. Um, I have a question regarding the, <clears throat> the other day, uh, the head of the foreign diplomacy of the EU, Mr. Josep Borrell, made a contradictional statement uh, talking about the uh, military supplies to Ukraine. He said, quote unquote, this war will be won on the battlefield. How can you commend that the diplomat, the highest ranking diplomat is talking about the war and uh, solving the problem by the war means? Thank you. Look, uh, I'm not gonna do running commentary on what various senior officials say around the world. Our focus is on the humanitarian situation and our focus is also on trying to get a pause, a ceasefire uh, done as quickly as possible for humanitarian reasons. Uh, Iftikhar. Uh, thanks, Kev. Uh, my question was asked by Edie about uh, the change of government in Pakistan. Unless you have... Uh, <laughs> that's what I That's government. what I figured. That's what I figured. Um, <laughs> I do not have anything else. Uh, Stefano. Yes, about the, uh, muscle, the missiles uh, that when they um, killed 50 civilians in Krama Kramatorsk, uh, there is a way to understand without, no doubt, where these uh, missiles was launched, from whom, who, you know, there is, that is the UN is able to do something like this without anybody saying like, oh, it's not sure. We, we, we have, we, we, have uh, our, we have human rights monitoring in Ukraine. They will look uh, at the situation and we'll see what they, what they report. Madam, and then we'll go to Abdel Hamid. Uh, Steph, um is the Secretary General ready or willing to go to Kiev? Secretary General is willing and ready to do anything that he thinks will be constructive in advancing uh, peace in Ukraine. So is he going or not? I, you know, when we travel, we announce. I can say he was willing to do anything that he feels will be actually constructive in uh, bringing peace uh, to Ukraine. Uh, Abdel Hamid. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, my question about the language Mr. Thor Winsland uses when it comes to Palestinians. He used the term heinous attack, but he didn't call the attack on this widow of 47 year old with six children a heinous attack, nor he called that a heinous attack on Muhammad Hussein Qasim, the 16 year old boy who was killed uh, in Jenin, nor he criticized the attack on the mother and the brother of Hal, Raed Hazen, who carried out the attack in Tel Aviv. Uh, his mother and uh, brother were attacked by IDF in Jenin also. So why there is selection of words that is not consistent with the uh, 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 Abdel Hamid, I, I'm not going to engage with you on a linguistics uh, debate. I think our messaging, the message from Tor Venislan, is pretty clear. Uh, no one wants to see one more civilian die. No one wants to see any more uh, violence, and that will be continue to guide our efforts. All right, I will go get uh, our guest and you can pepper him with questions.